Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, are you ready for me to say hello to everybody and introduce you? Yes. Go awesome. ahead. <laughs> so, um, let's kick off. I'm going to get myself a little note as well, so I don't forget to say any of the important things that I have to say. Um, but I will start fairly conventionally by saying, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Zofia Rake. Um, I'm not really sure what you can see at the moment uh, because I am new to Zoom, forgive me about this. Um, and uh, I would like you to all meet Leah. She will uh, take over in a moment. Uh, Leah is a, a British team member, para climber, uh, a coach and advocate for inclusivity in climbing. And um, also uh, she is a Patagonia sponsored athlete and Patagonia also sponsors our event this year, the physical event and the um, online events. So we are super psyched to, to align with such a, such a heritage brand. Um, and uh, in terms of practicalities, uh, you'll be able to ask questions. You should have a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of Leah's talk, I will choose a few for her to answer. Um, and then on Thursday, we will have our second um, talk in the series, which will be by Maddie Cope from Lattice Training, and you will get a separate link for another Zoom webinar for that. So please do keep checking your um, inboxes. And uh, in the meantime, please welcome Leah and uh, enjoy the talk. Lift as you climb, rising to new challenges and taking others with you. And um, I'm going to disappear now. So enjoy Leah and enjoy everybody else. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, my name is Leah Volpe. I'm a GB paraclimber and I also coach with Catalyst Climbing. So I also teach a kind of young squad of, of climbers in London. Um, so in terms of who I am and, you know, I've been climbing for four years now and I joined the GB para climbing team about two years ago now. Um, so when I'm not climbing, I work in health policy on work related to health inequalities and I also have a background in disability policy. So a bit of a kind of grounding and campaigning and disability justice. Um, obviously, this means I'm disabled as a paraclimber. Um, what is paraclimbing anyway? So it's a discipline of climbing that is specifically for disabled athletes. And, and that kind of falls in, in competitive paraclimbing into three main categories of impairment. So we've got kind of visual impairments um, with athletes climbing as a, with a sight guide, using a radio to guide them up the route. And um, uh, then there's kind of, oh, let me just sort my screen out. Apparently I've Oh no, <laughs> sorry, bear with me. No stress, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I'm there. No stress, oh, we're just gonna try no, and make no. the slides so they appear on the whole out. screen. That's probably uh, better, isn't it? There we go. Thank you. Um, I can't see my notes now, but that's fine. I'll just, I'll riff off of these slides. Um, so, back to um, the para climbing categories. So for upper and lower limb amputees, for so athletes with limb differences, either they've been born with or through kind of health or, or injury have, have had amputations of their limbs and they kind of climb in, in a category, kind of depending on where on the limb that, that they've kind of got their, their kind of what part of their limb they're missing. And then the category that I'm in is neurological and physical disabilities. So that's basically I say that's basically everything else it's there's a kind of set of of neurological and physical impairments that are considered eligible at the international level um so things like coordination difficulties um or kind of muscle tone problems balance issues um impaired range of motion things like that and so I guess the benefit of paraclimbing really is just kind of having that slightly more level playing field to compete with people who have disabilities like you and um i think there's just been for me a real benefit to having that just in terms of having a kind of community and community is something that i'll probably refer to quite a lot as part of this talk because it's really really key to kind of what i see as being so important about the sport um so why lift as you climb well that's 
actually kind of taken from a, the title of a book, which is about kind of solidarity and reciprocity among women and it's in kind of their careers in terms of, you know, as you climb up the ladder and become more and more successful, bringing people with you. So, so having that kind of element of having a, knowing what you can offer to other people around you. And I think that that is something that I've learned is really, really important in climbing as a sport. I think it's something that, you know, we all pick up bits of learning here and there, and we know different, we have different skills and experiences. And I think sharing those with people is something that can help make the sport much more inclusive. So in terms of my journey to climbing, I started climbing four years ago and that kind of started out because I'd had this experience of developing a disability. I became quite unwell. I lost a lot of mobility. I had really serious fatigue, spinal issues. You can see in the picture, I have a spinal brace. And after quite a long period of time of not really being able to do anything, actually, I wanted to be active again. So I had been a competitive athlete in the past. This is me. Um, I'm at the front of the boat rowing um, for Oxford there. And that was a huge part of my kind of younger years as a teenager was being in competitive sport and being in that kind of exhilarating competition environment. And that was just something that felt like a real loss when I became unwell, I couldn't do any of it anymore. And, and so it was actually a friend who kind of suggested that I try climbing. And I thought, well, you must be mad. I'm a wheelchair user, this is just never gonna work. But I, I tried it out and I was actually kind of hooked. And so it was actually through uh, an organization called Paraclimbing London that I was first introduced to paraclimbing as a concept. And it was kind of, it was kind of strange to kind of discover for the first time like there is a there is a place in competitive sport for me still like even though I'm disabled and that was kind of the start of something I think so the first um the first national paraclimbing competition in the picture on the left I I went along I can't believe how nervous I was but I won the competition and I think from there I kind of felt that there was maybe something in it and maybe something there for me that could bring back what I felt that I had lost. Um, and then on the right is actually the paraclimbing version of Blockfest um, in, at the castle in London a couple of years ago. Um, and I think both of those are kind of two examples of where other people have kind of brought me along with them. So friends from Paraclimbing London encouraged me to start competing and then and then the, the, the Blockfest guys were kind enough to put on a paraclimbing event for us. And, and it's kind of through others that I've had these opportunities. So I think that's kind of, you know, what I wanted to talk about is how we define success as athletes, I think can often feel, particularly in climbing, when, when you're on the wall, it's just you. It can feel like quite an individual thing. You know, success is something that we do for ourselves and we create for ourselves. And I think as a paraclimber, as a disabled athlete who has needed quite a lot of help at different points and needed a lot of kind of guidance and needed adaptations to the way that I train and, and the way that I compete. It's having people out there willing to support me with that has, has helped define that success. And it's, you know, it's, for me, it's not just about as a successful athlete, how many medals am I winning? You know, am I winning world championships? Am I winning competitions? Am I climbing new grades? And achieving sort of physical climbing benchmarks that I want to achieve but rather am I you know if I if I go and win the climbing para climbing world championships in Russia in a month who does that benefit other than me you know is there something for my community that I'm actually kind of contributing something so that people who come behind me are, are kind of gaining something from my success I think I can't really think about success in terms of just myself and that was new to me through climbing I think I don't I don't think that was a, an attitude that I had before becoming disabled nor before before climbing it feels like climbing is such a unique sport in that it's it's so communal even though it's indiv it's an individual pursuit um so I think when I'm thinking about success in the past and in the future it's often about the people who've been around me as much as it has been about the specific achievement itself. So here on the left is me winning bronze at the Paraclimbing World Championships in 2019. Um, but when I think about 
you know what that experience meant to me it wasn't just I climbed really well on the day or I was really strong but it was you know I had a coach who was behind me all the way and I had people who encouraged me to enter and encouraged me to believe in myself and were there to support me throughout the experience so um I think that's been like really pivotal for me um so lifting as you climb I I think there's kind of three elements to this so you know if I was to, you know, if I was to say to, to folks, what is, what do I think lifting as you climb is, what is it to bring people with you and, and use your success to, to lift others up as well? I think in climbing, this is important because we've had this reckoning over the past year, I think about diversity in our sport. So, you know, do we have diverse faces in climbing media? Do we have diversity in climbing competition? Do we see, beyond the kind of typical white male persona of a climber that you might imagine as being the kind of typical outdoor adventurer. And in lots of ways, I think that, you know, I climb in London and I think there's a bit of a bubble in, in terms of actually being a more diverse place than maybe the majority of this country. You may be, you know, here in London, we see a kind of, it's sort of disguised almost as, as actually there isn't a diversity issue. And I suppose if you think about the diversity issue at, at large, you kind of think, what's the problem? Um, anybody is welcome in, in climbing. And I like to think about making climbing a welcoming sport, not just by, and I say this all the time, but I say not just by kind of saying, well, the door to, to the sport, the door to the climbing gym or the crag or whatever is there. You can go and walk in if you like. It's about kind of propping that door open and saying, come in, come and see what we can offer you and what it is that, makes it a welcoming place for you to be that you want to stay um if i reflect on my first time walking into a climbing gym as a disabled athlete and it might not have been visible to everybody but kind of it feels quite kind of alien to walk into a a gym and kind of know that you're maybe not the most able-bodied person there and you're maybe not the person that the space has been designed for but it's really, really simple things such as just a friendly face smiling at you, encouraging you on a climb that you know that they would find so easy, but you know, as a new climber, they know that you're challenged and, and you need that encouragement. And I think that was what made me want to, want to keep climbing. And I think that's an experience that I know that as someone who is a much more experienced climber now and has a bit of a voice and a, and a platform on social media, I can, replicate that for for new climbers and that really motivates me so um that kind of is my second point on paying it forward and then I think showing visible leadership is is just understanding that we have we all have power in our spheres that we climb in like not you know we're not all like Adam Ondra with huge amounts of influence in the climbing world but we are all influential in our communities whether it's even within our family, within our small group of friends, just in our, in the like regular, like weekday evening climbing group that of regulars at your local gym, you have influence. And I think it's knowing how to use that to the benefit of the wider community. So kind of elaborating on, on each individual bit, bringing people with you. I mean, you know, like I said before, it's just, I, as a relatively successful para athlete, I, I'm not here off my own back. I'm here on the backs of people who've come before me and laid the path to grow paraclimbing and turn it into a like well-respected discipline of, of climbing, get those IFSC competitions running on the back of coaches who've developed training methods for people with conditions like mine and got to like understand how to train people like me and, and keep them healthy and strong. And off the back of, of people who've made encourage gyms to become more accessible so that you know I can go to the gym in my wheelchair and be able to get in the door um I think it's all of those people who have you know been willing to bring the para climbing community with us that has helped build this community and I just reflect on how para climbing has grown in the past even in the four years that I've been involved with it it's gone from being something that's quite small to something that's actually I've, you know, it's actually quite rare, I think, now that I would meet someone and say, you know, I, do you know about paraclimbing? They would say, no, I've never heard of that before. It's something that people know about. And that feels really, actually really rewarding to have 
been part of that growth. And so I think it's knowing that, you know, whether you're a power climber or not, it's that you could have that influence over someone else who you might meet to just kind of bring them along with you as you succeed. You know, you have a, you have a share your success with people. And, and I think just really fostering that sense of community in climbing, we can all do that. And then I think mentorship is something that has been really, really essential in my journey as a climber. Um, and, you know, it's not so much a case of having these formal mentoring, mentee relationships with people who, between someone who's really experienced and someone who's not at all experienced, but just this like sharing, learning and experience all the time is something that we do. And, you know, I'm sure everybody listening to this can kind of reflect on conversations they've had with friends or even just like staff at the, at the local climbing gym or just people who they've seen at the crag who are really very you know really vastly different experiences and you can share your experience as a young climber just as they could share their experience with you as a kind of really old time trad climber for example or, or any of those different bits of the climbing community that have slightly different dynamics and cultures um I think just understanding that you always have something to share with others that is of value um, I think has been really helpful. And I think mentorship is something that's really kind of helped me out as a, like, I think as a para athlete, you can, I lacked confidence. I had imposter syndrome. I thought, you know, how am I ever going to be a successful climber if I, you know, can't even easily climb a flight of stairs, for example. And I think just having people around me who are able to point out my strengths and help me build on those is really helpful. And that's something that particularly as a coach I love to do is is have that well, coaching relationship with someone where you help them see like their strengths and how they can how they can learn and improve so there's that and then finally I think this feels like the most important thing for me is just showing that visible leadership and knowing what power you have so we all have privilege whether that's white privilege or thin privilege or able-bodied privilege or whatever it might be I think it's knowing what having that privilege can do for someone else in your community so for example as a as a white climber if I kind of witness racism in my community then I can call it out and be a leader in in the sport by doing that and and then similarly more kind of focused on para climbing over the past year there's been some changes to our competitive classification system that has um, disadvantaged some athletes and benefited some others. And as an athlete who may stand to benefit from the changes, I have felt it has been really important to use the, the voice that I have and the influence that I have as, a, as somebody who could benefit from this change to point out who actually stands to lose and, and what it is that we as a community have a responsibility to kind of stand up for people who are maybe who maybe don't have the loudest voices in in our in our sport so I think those are my kind of main reflections on what it means to lift as you climb um, and I'd be really happy to take questions um, cool that was fantastic um, I don't know if you can see me but you can hear me I can. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, thank you so much. That was great. I loved the part when you like said that you changed your definition of success to thinking about how your um, success affects others. That was really like um, interesting to to realize. And also that you said that you you got that from becoming a paraclimber. That you had that new perspective, right? Mm. Yeah. Um. Is there any question that anybody would like to ask? Now is the time, please. And um, you've got this little Q&A button at the bottom. Um, I hope people can see that Q&A button. <laughs> but if you, uh, if you um, attendees press that Q&A button, Q&A questions should come up for Leah. Otherwise, um, we will be here for a moment and um, waiting for something to come up and um, yeah, so um, how much, like a little bit away from the subject matter, but what is the balance of your climbing indoors and outdoors? Are you mostly focused on competitions at the moment? 
Yeah, at the moment I'm preparing for I'm preparing for the para climbing championships in in Moscow. Moscow. In, yeah, in mid September. So we're about a month away now. Actually, just under a month. Yeah. Um. So yeah, really focused on kind of indoor climbing and comp preparation and yeah. just a lot of endurance actually because um para climbing competitions are you know lead competitions where they're on top rope but they're on routes um we climb on the same walls as the as the able-bodied sure. um, senior athletes so yeah long routes and so I think um normally day to day I mean I keep saying I would really like to get more into outdoor climbing but accessibility is a little bit of a challenge for me so Sure. um I haven't I haven't done a huge amount of outdoor climbing actually I I would like to do more I'd say I'm more of a boulderer um than a than a than a sport climber but uh yeah hopefully fingers crossed next year and one thing that I wanted to uh highlight here is that this Moscow championship is the reason why we can't get you physically at the women's bouldering yeah, festival I know which is a great pity <laughs> um because I think you'd love Fontainebleau especially for um it's super easy approaches yeah I was chatting to a fellow paraclimber actually on at the weekend and he was saying that um Font is probably ideal for me actually so yeah I'm hoping to get out there sometime soon that but sadly there's a clash this time <laughs> uh we've got some questions coming in and uh um yeah that's just something that sort of is in line with what we have been mentioning at the moment a uh, question from uh Tan Lu Chok as an outdoors climbing club what can we do to make climbing more accessible and inclusive to more communities as an outdoors climbing club? So I think as an outdoor climbing club, I think your kind of number one source of source of information is is actually to kind of talk to your um, talk to your communities, actually, and, and see if you can find some local um, para climbers who would like to get involved and find out what it is they need. Um, because the crags that you're going to, they might have accessibility challenges that actually with some kind of curiosity and problem solving, you can actually find ways of, of getting around those and making them more accessible. And I, I but I think having, just having that information as well on your, having information kind of out there available about what adjustments you're able and willing to make and that you're also willing to have that conversation with paraclimbers who would like to use your use your kind of join your club I think would is really helpful because it's just like that sense of like knowing that that you're that you've been as a paraclimber I think when you know that you've been thought about that accessibility has been thought about even if it's not perfect is really meaningful and I think just kind of affirming that it's just like we we as para athletes belong just as much as able-bodied athletes do so and yeah I think my number one tip is just about kind of communication um because and representation as well you know if you have social media or you have you know a website don't just show able-bodied climbers um show kind of a variety of, of people to show that like it's for more than just people who might find it super easy to access outdoor climbing and maybe also just communicating with the Absolutely. paraclimbing community about particular mm. crags because when able-bodied people tend to think about crags uh, you don't kind of notice like oh there is a big stone step that somebody has to get over mm. because that is really easy for somebody with the use of their legs but with somebody say on a wheelchair that might be completely impossible mm -hmm. so maybe also trying to think in the terms of what the challenges at this crag are informing the paraclimbing community and mm -hmm. saying like we could fix how or like just asking how would that be a problem could we fix that for you mm -hmm. um because yeah. I guess yeah a lot of people might not like think about it I remember seeing in uh Rodeyar, actually uh there is a really famous um sport climber who's got a Spanish name so I forgot it now but um he moves on crutches with one leg mm -hmm. and like he's absolutely insane at being able to like walk up steep hills and down steep hills that like you can just absolutely lose your teeth on but mm -hmm. this is not the norm like he's more yeah. agile on his one leg than your average person is on two legs and I think maybe thinking about that I don't yeah. know if it makes sense no I think that's really important to remember that everyone is so different and that you know one one disabled person might find an approach so much easier than another disabled person and 
yeah and I think it's just kind of recognizing that everyone is is different and has their own kind of ways of adapting to their situation as well and um, we've got a question from Florian Brenken, who's uh, saying that it was a really nice talk, and I agree with that. And he wanted to ask what a typical training session looks like for you, and do you warm up and stuff like that? I think there's actually loads of resources on training on your Instagram account. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Florian. Yeah, no, I, the training resources in they were a lockdown project. Um, I just kind of I think just out of kind of isolation and and boredom wanted to share what I was doing during um, during the lockdown to keep fit. I in terms of my typical training, it, it does vary a bit. Um, depends what time of year it is. So at the moment, for example, yeah, I always warm up. I do kind of lots of mobility, easy climbing, some pull-ups, um, just until I sort of feel ready to train. I don't have anything really kind of standard that I always do. And then I would typically have two strength bouldering workouts a week and two endurance workouts a week. Um, sadly, that's about to increase to three endurance workouts a week. Um, <laughs> and, and then on top of that, during the winter, I would do um, strength training and, and just overall conditioning, and plenty of stretching. And I'm guessing you're on a regular training program, so you don't like choose your sessions ad hoc, but you follow a structured yeah, schedule. Yeah, I, I, I always work with a coach. I, I just quite like to not have to make too many decisions about what training I'm doing. Um, it just, it takes a lot of the kind of thinking away. I think because I work full time, I have two jobs. And so it can just be a little bit to then have to plan all my training. It's just, that's not the one. So I work with a coach always, yeah. We've got a question from Ellen. Uh, when you have a low day, what's your best remedy to go to the gym and train anyway, like lift yourself up? Always, uh, on a hard day, always climb with friends and have like an easy, um, or not necessarily physically easy, but just relaxed and fun session. And just remember like, you know, on a day where your mood is low, I think it's always best to just not put too much pressure on yourself and remember why you climb in the first place. Um, because we all, none of us took up climbing to train super hard in the first instance. We took it up because it looked super fun. So I think going back to that is always a good mood booster. Especially if you climb alongside and try, climb and train alongside work, like it's so easy not to be in prime condition for a training session. Mm -hmm. So that's a really nice tip, I think, because it's so hard to have the same pressure in at work and then the same pressure yeah training yeah. um there is a question from Gemma Powell how did you overcome your imposter syndrome that's a good one. Oh gosh that is a good question <laughs> Gemma I don't think I've completely overcome my imposter syndrome but I think the number one thing that has helped me the most is to just remember that everyone is so unique and different and that comparisons with other climbers whether they're other para climbers or whether they're with able-bodied climbers are they're you know they're only they're only helpful as far as as far as to help you benchmark and like learn but they're not helpful once they get to the point where you start to just feel bad about yourself because you've compared yourself to someone whose life and situation and body and experience and climbing style is completely completely different so I do still think I experience imposter syndrome a lot and often think you know am I do I belong in para climbing do I belong in able-bodied climbing I sometimes not sure if I belong in either and actually you know I think that does kind of lead to you know I'll just be training day to day or at a kind of friendly competition locally and and I'll start to feel down on myself because I'm not climbing as well as the completely able-bodied people who've been climbing for 15 years um so I don't know I think it can be quite a fine balance but it's just remembering that it's normal to feel uncertain of yourself sometimes but that ultimately you are your own person there are people out there who really admire you just because of who you are and that's a good thing to kind of embody when you're thinking oh I should be better or I should be different that's great 
Um, we've got a question about root setting from Anna Hukelheim. And it's actually a question that I might forward for our root setting um, talk, which is upcoming with Nora and Nat. But from your perspective, um, as uh, do, do you root set any time or not really? No, no, I've never so, done it. No. So as a as an athlete, and I guess as a probably also commercial gym user, um, what would you suggest for root setters to help um, make climbing more accessible? So I think there's a there's a few things you can do. I mean, so it depends. There's you know a vast range of different disabilities, and all have different needs in terms of route setting. Um, and I guess the first thing to kind of remember is also that often we have different ways of finding kind of alternative beta, and sometimes the best way of making something accessible is to is for the is to not try and force certain moves in a way that means that if you don't have the kind of phenotype the body type to be able to do that move then you can't do the climb at all I think it's being really open-minded to the value of having alternatives to a dynamic move or to a big reach even by adding really small intermediates and similarly if somebody has like a smaller span then it's because they've got a limb difference or because they're you know of reduced height then it's like the frustration of not being able to do a move because it's it's not nobody was thinking of your body type when it was set and didn't think to make it possible for you to do it even in the non-intended way I think it's just it can be frustrating so I think just having that in mind as a root setter is always helpful that just it's not just about women versus men or short people versus tall people but it's also about people with all kinds of disabilities and they deserve a really good experience of climbing too. I guess other things you can do is, you know, things like having, making sure that the colors that you're setting with contrast well against the background and that you haven't got, you know, a, a light pink route next to a dark pink route because it can be really difficult for someone with a visual impairment or color blindness to distinguish between, between those, so that's really good. And then for me, personally because my main issues are around kind of coordination balance and accuracy like I'm personally a big fan of routes that have like big footholds big slopers and volumes um but then for someone else they might find that a nightmare so actually often kind of accessible route setting comes down to just natural variation in styles too so and it just has to be rocket science, but having loads of different climbs that mean that it's not only a certain type of body that succeeds in yeah. in a certain set, because I think For that sure. is the worst. Like when you feel like, oh, it's only somebody who's super dynamic and six foot tall that like yeah. does well across the gym. But if you've got other skills or like you said, um, have got like a height um, restriction or mm -hmm. like smaller span like why wouldn't you be able to succeed and show how good you are which is actually super interesting because I um, have been recently witnessing online and in Fontainebleau um, the sort of great success of a paraclimber called Solène Pire and mm -hmm. she's got a super short span because um, she's an amputee and she is able to succeed on boulders that have reputation for being spanny because mm -hmm. she just finds her different beta. So in that way, I think that oddly, sometimes climbing outdoors, once you access the rock, can be more accessible than climbing on plastic. Would you say that can be the case? I've heard that. I have heard that. And I can see how it could be the case. I mean, because there are usually... I actually don't know that much about rock climbing, but often there's like small intermediates that if you don't need to use it, you wouldn't bother. But if you do need it, it can be used. Like where there's a will, there's can a be way. A lifesaver. Yeah. Whereas you know, on a on an indoor climb, the root set is set it how they've set it, and if the next yellow hole is three foot up the wall and you can't reach, then you can't reach. Um, there are sometimes ways around it, like becoming more dynamic, but that's not an option for everybody. So yeah, I think outdoor climbing can be a bit more adaptable in terms of kind of finding beta for sure. Also what you said before about climbing clubs, like if listening is so important, then should be surely the same case for root setting, like for gyms to see like who comes through the door and also to make sure that people who might think like, oh, this is not for me, they are reached and told actually, if you come here, you're gonna have a great time, right? 
because there might yeah. be loads of people who are um disabled like have a disability and they wouldn't even like consider like if they're new to climbing i guess it's there is a bigger barrier to starting climbing than for able-bodied people i think so you know i think when you're disabled it's not as easy to just even you know even taking away accessibility barriers to the gym itself i think it's not always easy to walk into an athletic environment as a disabled person and feel yeah feel a sense of belonging straight away you know for me it was something that i had to work through some anxieties and nerves for a long time before i felt really like integrated into the climbing community and that's not anyone's fault but it's just it's just the case of you know when you're disabled it can just feel like the world isn't really built for you and you're dealing with your own personal like physical challenges and potentially dealing with pain and fatigue and you know you're not quite sure how to you know you're watching other people around you climbing but they don't climb like you or you know you try and execute a move that you've seen someone else do and it's like oh but my you know I, my limbs don't bend in that way or or whatever it might be so you know I think if if the environment feels really welcoming you know accessibility has clearly been thought about and you know if you if you walk into a place and it feels generally quite accessible and you can go to the bathroom and use the shower and get in the building and order a coffee and all of those kinds of things then actually the climbing element you're already at ease you're not feeling like kind of restricted or you haven't had to ask for loads of help and you don't feel like a burden so then it's like okay now it's ready it's time for me to start climbing and I feel relaxed and ready it does make a huge difference and I, you know sometimes it really just just come down to something as simple as like the people who work here who have built this place and run this place they're not they're not surprised to see me arrive you know I think nobody's questioning the fact that a wheelchair user has come in here to come climbing I think that is where it feels the most when a it's is a is when climbing feels the most welcoming when it just feels natural for me to be there and that's for me because I've been doing it for years it feels like that all the time now but you can imagine if you're new it you don't expect that so to be kind of pleasantly surprised I think is really really valuable yeah and also to even have a chance for that pleasant surprise, there surely has to be some, so as you said before, like there has to be representation. That means that people who are maybe not this like typical uh, climbing mall user, that they will mm. they feel welcome. Like the only way I can sort of imagine relating is starting climbing as a female presenting person and also feeling a little bit out of place. So I think that belonging to whatever kind of marginalized group people should have enough empathy to to be able to try and you know just think from somebody else's perspective like mm -hmm. how would i make it welcoming um yeah. there is another question from florian um which i would have absolutely no idea how to answer so it's fantastic that you might be able to help us are there any kind of products that might help disabled people with climbing Oh, that is a really good question. Wow. I'm trying to, th I'm, let me think. <laughs> yeah. I, it I think it massively depends on your disability. I mean, I mean, actually, when you think about it, things like, so I have a friend, for example, who has a neck issue, has difficulty looking up. And so belay goggles help them make be laying more accessible to them. Um, a clip stick might make it more accessible to someone who would not feel safe climbing to the first bolt because a fall might be dangerous. Um, things like, um, oh, oh, that's, as, that's as far as I can go. Oh, um, friends of mine who climb with upper limb differences use like regular climbing tape to protect the skin on their on their forearm so those kinds of things actually it's just normal products just used, used outside in of the an, box yeah exactly yeah I think that's that's typically the way that I've seen it in the past um I haven't um yeah those are my those are the examples I can think of <laughs> I even now thinking like for a wheelchair user to access Phantom Blur like um bouldering pads you can't put on your back so that would have to be adjusted but also mm. obviously i guess then need, there needs to be assistance to get off the boulder 
but you might well, you might be two people, one able-bodied person, one on a wheelchair, and one carries a pad, the other also carries a pad. So that would need mm-hmm. to be adjusted. But it's all, I think, very... Um, because still, like, there are not that many disabled people. So I guess there wouldn't be any products in, like, regular production. It's all customiz- customization. I don't think there's any specific products, no. I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the beauty of it is just this, like, problem-solving culture in disability it's like a real it's a real thing not just in climbing but also more widely that like we're kind of in the world at large constantly faced with accessibility barriers and always finding ways around it just to like go about day-to-day life so climbing is no different from that and actually I think the nicest thing about being a paraclimber is just friends you know you climb with a group you go on a trip with a group and you just figure out a way around a problem that you might be facing and and then you know for next time and it's easy next time so um yeah it's a lot of like just thinking outside of the box like you say yeah cool yeah because I guess it's all down to really willingness of like everybody to like Mm -hmm. for the disabled person to put themselves out there that might feel uncomfortable and then to have a support system of people who are going to be like yeah sure we'll sort it out and exactly. not to make it feel weird, I suppose, because like, yeah. why would it? Yeah, for sure. It's definitely, right. definitely that. <laughs> Are there any organizations, resources? That's another question from Tan Lu Chok. Um, any resources that you can recommend for able-bodied climbers to be better allies for disabled climbers? And in general, are there any sort of organizations that represent para climbers as a, as a whole? Any sort of like advocacy groups, stuff like that? I, if I start listing them, I risk missing some out. Um, I would love to share some with you for, to post though in on social media perhaps, but uh, the main ones that spring to mind are obviously in London and Paraclimbing London, um, run by two paraclimbers and a group of also volunteers who are also a mix of paraclimbers and non-paraclimbers run kind of coached, ex- well, instructed accessible sessions for for paraclimbers who can basically get to London um, not just those living in London and um, United We Climb which is a small kind of coalition of people advocating for diversity and climbing more widely but um, including paraclimbing um, and they're running a survey at the moment about paraclimbing if I can plug that for oh, anyone cool, yeah. who's um, doing a little bit of research into the experiences of paraclimbers both in gyms and competition and outdoors just to find out a bit more about what's needed I've kind of been involved in that and yeah I think having that information to hand I think will be really valuable to helping like make small changes that that might be needed just to make life a little bit easier for paraclimbers after the talk please do send me any links that you want to share and then yeah. I'll just get them out there through our social media and maybe also Thank pop you. them in like a general newsletter that we will create after all of the talks are done and then for every single sure. panelist we'll have like a resource or two or three or however many people want to recommend and I think that could be helpful um Brilliant. So I think if there are no more questions, we are kind of ready to be wrapping it up unless you, Leah, have got something that you'd like to share um, otherwise, that, other than we have covered so far, <laughs> sorry. I don't think so. Just thank you so much for all your really good questions and for listening. It's really, it's nice to be able to kind of be able to kind of share the experience now as quite a season paraclimb and feeling quite comfortable as a climber now rather than someone who's like out there looking for the answers it's nice to actually have some of them now which is good Um, it's fantastic for us to have you with all the sort of observations and 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 know-how and your experiences so thank you so much well thank you for having me and thank you to everybody for tuning in and thank you to patagonia for sponsoring us I will attempt switching off Zoom now. (laughs) (laughs) Cheers, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.